Well, I finally did it. I read Shogun by James Clavell. Or should I say I listened to Shogun by James Clavell. Despite actually owning a copy of the book itself, its great length instead led me to acquire the audiobook of it, which I was able to listen to while painting miniatures. And after 53 hours of experiencing this vast and epic story, I finally completed it. So, let's talk about it. And obviously because it seems like a lot of people who watch my channel have already read it, we will be getting into spoilers. First off, we should probably discuss why I chose now to finally read slash listen to it. Well, of course it has a lot to do with the new adaption of the story which will be premiering later this month on FX and Hulu, something which I know myself and many of you have been eagerly looking forward to. However, what really got me to finally experience this story was plenty of the comments I've gotten not only on my original review of the 1980 miniseries, but also from the video I made where I gave my impressions of the trailer for the new series. So many of you have such extremely strong connections to this story. Passions that run back decades and perhaps was the sole reason why you might have become so invested in Japan and Japanese history. This story, and in particular the book, is beloved, and I don't think I've seen or heard anyone ever speak ill of it. And while I did get tons of great comments encouraging me to finally read it, with details regarding how the book has impacted many of you, I also got plenty of silly comments telling me that I had no right to review any version of the show, either the 1980 adaption or the new one, unless I had read the book first. So, to those of you who did post plenty of friendly and encouraging comments recommending the book to me, I thank you, you really did help inspire me to finally do it. And to those of you who think I have no right reviewing any adaption of it without reading the book first, well, here you go, I finally have. Despite the fact that yes, I listened to it and didn't actually sit down and read it cover to cover. So what are my thoughts of the book? Overall, I did very much enjoy it. Did I think it was perfect? No, no I did not, but that's for a few reasons we are going to get into. One of the main things that stuck out to me right away was the presence of plenty of outdated or more pop culture portrayals of certain things that are very prevalent in it. Now that doesn't mean the book is bad whatsoever. The story is historical fiction and is in no way trying to say that this is how things really were. Rather it just means that more context is needed to help illustrate what the truth of the matter really is in terms of real history. And while some of these could perhaps be seen as mere nitpicks, being that others are intertwined very closely to the story, I do feel they need to be brought up. Of course, if you are a longtime viewer of the channel or someone with already a fair bit of knowledge in the subject of Japanese history, none of these should be new for you. Let's start off with the book's portrayal of samurai honor. This is of course the heart and soul of how every samurai acts. As the book explains, their idea of honorific concepts such as duty, loyalty, justice, and so forth. And yes, we do get references occasionally to the concept of Bushido, something which is indeed a false idea that plenty of people like to think the samurai followed. In reality, Bushido was never really a thing at this point in samurai history. There was never a code or a specific set of philosophies and values that the samurai swore by or tried to live by. That entire idea came almost after the fact. But the idea of honor itself is such an integral element in the story and dictates everything about samurai conduct. And this is particularly important to what samurai in the book find as honorable and dishonorable. The samurai in the book find any act of striking without warning or in ambush as dishonorable, and this extends very significantly to the use of firearms, which the samurai in the book are mostly all very opposed to, besides a few. This is a ridiculous notion by this point in real history, as every samurai army was fielding hundreds if not thousands of guns. It was just naturally how warfare had advanced, and there was nothing that any samurai saw as dishonorable about it. The important thing was winning after all, and not falling behind the times. I was surprised how integral this detail became in the book, and to be honest I don't recall if it was as significant in the 1980 adaption or not. Perhaps it was, but I just don't remember at this time. But I can definitely see how this misinformation about samurai finding guns dishonorable may have perhaps all started here and became such a popular myth that continues on to this very day. Another big standout misconception, but not one that is nearly as bad, is the way the book portrays ninja, or shinobi. The book buys deep into the myth of the ninja. Guys wearing all black clothing, leaping from rooftops, and throwing shurikens. None of this is true to real history and is more influenced by pop culture tropes. Yet besides these silly details, the way the book actually uses Shinobi is pretty reasonable. I specifically like the part where they attack the castle in Osaka. 
That entire sequence, despite the inaccuracies of their appearance and some of the weaponry, is actually pretty well put together, so it's not all bad when it comes to them. Now I do need to say that in terms of both this samurai idea of honor and the portrayal of ninja, these two concepts I believe actually show more that the book is a product of its time. Bushido and ninja imagery along with so many more little details were all rising in popularity throughout much of the 70s and 80s, so I do get why they were so prevalent here. And I'd like to believe that if the story was written today, that it would be more grounded in reality. Or so I would hope. Now, I'm not going to detail what the whole story of Shogun is in this video. I imagine if you are watching this, you already know about it. But if you haven't yet, I'll leave a link down below to my review of the 1980 miniseries, in which I do discuss more about what the story is. But basically, yeah, it's a loose, fictional retelling of the events leading up to the Battle of Sekigahara in the year 1600, on top of the arrival of William Adams, or in the story of Shogun, John Blackthorne. Now, obviously being that I watched the 1980 adaption before reading the book, I came into the book with plenty of the visuals in my head of the elements which were found there. So I do apologize that as we proceed I will be sort of looking at this backwards, comparing what I already knew about the story to how it actually is done in the book itself. Let's start off with the main character, John Blackthorne. I definitely like the Blackthorne of the book way more. Although he still had plenty of the same petty arrogance which we saw in the 1980 adaption, he was much more tolerable and perhaps even level-headed. Of course, the book has much more time to flesh him out as a complex character, so while the version we saw in the 1980 adaption just came off as stubborn and foolish, you get much more into his headspace in the book, and we are able to understand more about his motives and why he acts the way he does. On top of the fact that I much prefer the way the book goes about showing how Blackthorn adapts and really starts to like the Japanese lifestyle. From simple things like their cleanliness, to more sophisticated things like the way they think about the world and a person's place in it. You really start to get the sense that Blackthorn is much more conflicted about what he wants for his future, as he starts to wonder if he even wants to leave Japan at all. You can really tell that he starts to feel like he is Japanese. I like that concept because it falls much more in line with the real figure of William Adams, who too came well into his position in Japan and was more inclined to keep his status there than return home to England. And of course, you can't talk about Blackthorn without also talking about Mariko, who I have seen others describe as the real heart and soul of the story. I love how Mariko was portrayed in the book. The Mariko of the 1980 adaption just came off as wooden to me. Perhaps because Yoko Shimada, who played Mariko in the 1980 adaption, came late into the production and apparently suffered with other issues relating to speaking English in the role. The Mariko in the book, however, is much more multidimensional, for obvious reasons. And to be honest, based on how the book described her, I actually kept envisioning her as instead looking like Kaoru Yachigusa, who played Otsu in the Miyamoto Musashi Samurai Trilogy. The character of Mariko is based off of the real-life figure of Hosokawa Gracia, the daughter of Akechi Mitsuhide. And although things line up perfectly with her death in the book and her death in real history, she of course was not close to William Adams and had no affair with him. Still, I really enjoyed her character in the book, with her being described as extremely beautiful, but small and unassuming, while also being exceptionally cunning and an absolute asset to Toranaga. Besides the fact that yes, her backstory is also super interesting and her relationship with her husband Buntoro is much more complex. And as far as the romance between Blackthorn and Mariko goes, I actually didn't mind it here whatsoever. While I feel their romance completely derailed the story of the 1980 adaption, with Blackthorn coming off as almost blinded by love and not caring about anything else, I felt here that it meshed much better with the surrounding story of sophisticated political intrigue, something which was always an element within their relationship. It never took away from the larger epic tale at hand. And I do have to say that plenty of the comments I got that said the story of the book is that of mostly a love story, I have to firmly disagree with. I feel it is merely just an integral piece to the overall puzzle. But as for the rest of the characters themselves, the only other real major standouts for me interestingly enough were Omi and Father Alvito. Although I liked the book versions of Torinaga, Yabu, and Rodrigo very much, they never really drifted too far away from what I already knew about them from the 1980 adaption and were pretty in line with my feelings I already had for them. Omi, on the other hand, is much more of a sophisticated character in the book, and I really love that. I like how he is seen as far more intelligent and skilled than Yabu, and how Toranaka even comes to see this. I also like how he actually has a ton of ambition himself, and how he tried to even befriend Blackthorn, even after publicly disgracing him. I really hope this is how they portray Omi in the upcoming adaption. And in terms of Father Alvito, 
I also really enjoyed his unique dynamic with Blackthorn, and thought the two worked very well as foils of each other, as their relationship was usually one of vicious hostility and holier-than-thou vibes, only by the end for them to come to a truce which felt earned and meaningful, like they finally came to truly understand one another. Although these were all things I liked or was rather content with, now I think it's also fair to just comment on several more problems I had with the book overall by the end. None of these are major issues, but they did subtract from the story in some ways for me. One of the biggest problems I had right away is that there just was a lot of extra fluff and excessive sequences in the book that did feel like they dragged a bit on and on. And I'm not saying that this is always bad, because I know that they helped to build the overall world of the story. Besides the fact that, with the book being over 1,000 pages long, sections like these are to be expected. I was also surprised at other elements in the story that just seemed perhaps a bit needless. Things such as, for the sake of YouTube I'll say, male organ size and adult pleasure objects. I didn't find it strange when these things were brought up, but I did start to find it odd when they were repeatedly brought up. It's like, okay, what kind of story are we telling here? The last issue I had was, once again, with the ending. I was happy to see that Sekigahara was at least sort of brought up with the fact that Toranaga won, but yeah, I was disappointed once again that it and its aftermath were not shown in greater detail. But I feel I complained about that enough in my review of the 1980 adaption, so I'll spare you from that here. It does make me happy though that it was even brought up at all, because I did get the impression from some comments that the book actually ended before it even happens, so I was glad to see that it was sort of there after all, albeit to a lesser extent. And it also makes me excited, because I feel it opens the door for them to potentially expand upon it in the new series, hopefully. But just know that overall, none of these issues actually made me dislike the book, and I still found the entire story and experience very enjoyable. And I definitely would recommend the audiobook to anyone who has yet to experience it, being that that's how I did it. Of course, having now read it, I feel much better prepared to invest myself into the new series. Which, as of right now, my current plan is to review each episode as it premieres, with a final review of the whole series at the end. I'm really looking forward to seeing how this new adaption will unfold, and hopefully you will all join me on the journey through it. So, with that said, what are you most looking forward to in the new Shogun series? What are you excited to see from the book? Do you hope they will do anything differently, or would you rather they keep it roughly the same? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most interesting.